Good afternoon. Welcome to my living room here in Bertigny in Switzerland, located between Geneva and Lausanne. This is the last week of July 2016. And I'm going to give one of the teachings that I have, which I think is possibly one of the most important, particularly for missionaries, in um, learning to see nations as God sees them. Now some of my teaching, the way I do it, is to tell a story about a prince and a princess. And it's often a story that's well known, or sometimes not, but anyway, um, I will let you guess who I'm talking about, in case you've read this story before or heard it. Which is usually, usually the case with this one. So, the very best story begins like this, in the beginning. But this is not that story, this is a later one. And it begins like a lot of other good stories, once upon a time, long ago and far away. There was a prince, a warrior prince walking his land, which he did. He was a good prince and liked to stay close to his people. So he would walk throughout the land, up and down and around. And this particular morning, he was walking along a lonely road and he heard the distinctive cry of a newborn baby. And it was coming from the field over to his left. He couldn't see anything, but he went over in that direction and then the cry got louder. Um, the wailing of a hungry newborn. And he went over a little rise and there was the baby, a girl baby, who had not been washed after the birth and her cord had not been cut. She had been simply left there to die. As is the case, unfortunately, in many cultures. She was probably born into a, a poor family. Maybe they didn't have enough to feed the children they already had and could not imagine trying to raise another child. And of course, in many cultures, girl babies are not valued the way they should be, the way God sees them. So she was thrown out to die. But the prince decided she should live. So he, he picked her up, he took her and wrapped her in his cloak and walked off to the next village and asked around there until he found a good woman who was already nursing a baby, and went and talked to her and asked her if she would care for this newborn. And she said she would, and he had already heard from her reputation that she was a good mother. And so he gave her some silver coins and left her and telling her he'd be back in a few weeks. So he rearranged his walking through the land so that he would come by there again. And it was a couple months later, but when he saw the baby again, she was healthy. Had obviously put on weight and was happy. So he was reassured. He gave the woman some more silver coins. And then rearranged his walking through the land so that he would come through that particular village every few months or so. And the girl grew as babies do and it became obvious very early in her life that she was going to be very beautiful. She's one of these girls whose beauty shows up early and stays with her. She was also very bright and she was a leader. She could lead the other children in the, her part of the village in games and, and the prince found he liked spending time there with that family. It was a happy family. She was treated obviously like, like the other kids of the family. So they became kind of like a family to him, a family he had not had. 
And he found himself going back there more and more often. And then as, as the girl grew after a few years and turned from being a child into becoming a young woman, he found out that he was very attracted to her and actually started falling in love with her. Of course, this surprised him greatly because um, although he didn't have a wife and was kind of looking for one, he was in no hurry, she was much younger and she was a, a commoner as far as he knew. She was not royalty. But she was of his people and he decided that he loved her. So one day they were walking together and he proposed marriage. Now she was shocked. She had known the prince as her, her savior, really, the one who saved her from death, as her protector, as her provider, as prince of the land, but never imagined that um, he would ask her to be his future wife. And she was still young, there was no hurry, but they had a wonderful summer together. He spent extra time there, and then took her into the city and they bought clothes for her and jewelry and fine foods and new shoes and all kinds of things. He bought her her wedding gifts and they took them home so she could keep them in preparation for the wedding. But then an emergency arose in the northern part of the kingdom. The prince had to leave. So he told her, I'll be back. I can't, I can't be sure when, but um, I'm hoping it won't be long. So you wait for me. And she said, of course I'll wait for you. And so she waited. But the time of waiting turned from weeks into months, and then from months into a, a couple years. And... In the meantime, this girl, this future princess, she grew more and more beautiful. And she was no longer just 15, but turned into her, early te her later teenage years. She grew more and more beautiful, and the fame of her beauty went out far and wide, first in that region of the kingdom, where people said she was the most beautiful girl they'd ever seen, and then throughout the whole kingdom, and, and people came from far away to see her because the, her reputation was that she was the most beautiful girl in the kingdom. And then actually it went out, her fame went out to other nations, so they would come to visit. And at some point, and this is a question of the heart, at some point she trusted in her own beauty. She trusted in her own beauty, the story says, and became proud over something which really was not hers to be proud of. It was something she had received, her beauty. And the prince had decided that to give her what was necessary to even enhance her beauty, the good food, the nice clothes. But she took pride in it. And uh, other princes came around, young princes from the neighboring kingdoms, and they were very flattering, telling her that she was the most beautiful one they'd ever seen and laughing with her. And they were a lot more her age than the prince was and a lot less serious. So she was having a good time with these princes. And the memory of her prince started to fade from her mind. And she, she realized one day she didn't even remember what he looked like. She was having such a good time at parties with these princes who came with a lot of money and took her to the big city and and then came the point where she started to be unfaithful to her prince and not just once but several times and not just with one other prince but with many and of course the prince heard about this and he went back to her village as quickly as he could and found her and he was furious and she was in shock she'd never seen him in anger she'd just seen him in his his gentle love for her his provision more like a 
a father or older brother, but but now, now there was the fire of his fierce jealousy over her. And he said, what have you done? How could you act like this? You're worse than a prostitute, because at least a prostitute gets paid for what she does. But you took our wedding gifts and you gave them to these other princes. He went on to say it was even worse. You took the child, the children which were born to me and you passed them through the fire. In other words, in infant sacrifice. Now, you may realize, many of you listening, that um, we're talking about a story from the Bible, a prince and princess story, which is a powerful prophetic message given to the prophet, prophet Ezekiel in chapter 16. And I've just retold the parable pretty much as it's given to us. Um, and it's at a, one of these times which are common in the story of the people of God, unfortunately, when they've forgotten him and turned away and um, have gone after other gods. So he gives this long, detailed uh, prophetic parable to Ezekiel. And um, there are several interesting points that I want to draw out right here. One is, in verse um, 7, Ezekiel 16, verse 7, the first phrase says, I made you numerous like plants of the field. Now this is very instructive because this is how the Lord sees nations. Um, he sees each individual in each nation because individuals are important to him. But he sees the nation as a whole, as having one personality. And here in this, in this parable, the nation of Israel is addressed as a person, which is quite common in biblical language. Every time a prophet speaks to a nation in the Old Testament, the prophet uses the feminine singular pronoun. In other words, she or you in the feminine form. So the Lord sees each nation as a princess. Um, it's like in Birchney, we have all these little fields around the base on the hills around here. And when you see them from a distance, you see a block of color. In May, we see the, the coals of the, the canola fields, um, bright yellow. And then other times of the year, we see the gold of the ripe wheat. That's that's now in July. And then different shades of green. In winter we have blocks of green because the winter wheat keeps growing even, even through the snow. So you see the, the entity, the, the unity, the block of color. But it, as you're going out walking, next to these, these fields, you look down and you see each individual stalk of grain or, or whatever it is. So this is how the Lord sees the nations. And we see this in the Great Commission. The, the Great Commission commandment in Mark 16.15 is preach the gospel to every individual. So we know that individuals are important to God. But when he gives the same commandment in Matthew, he gives another dimension of it. Go to all the nations and disciple them. Teach them all that I have commanded you. So in that passage, nations is the, the direct object of the verb, disciple the nations. So each nation is important to God. We in the West have, have lost the facility to see a nation um, as one, because our nations are so diverse now and so divided, but it's still common in traditional cultures, and it was common in the past well into the 19th century in Europe because we can go into any city in Europe, any national museum, any city museum and see portrayals of the spirit of the nation or of the city as a princess. It's almost always a feminine person. There are exceptions like Rome where the first king of Rome was the twin who killed his brother I forget if it was Romulus who killed Remus and then became king. Anyway, that's, that's the father of Rome. But 
I can take you to two different sculptures in Geneva where you can see the, the idea they had of, of the spirit of Geneva. Actually, one of them is from the early 20th century. So this is how we used to see our cities and nations as having a personality. And I think we need to ask the Lord to be able to see a nation or a city or a town, whatever, a region, to see, to see the personality because he gives us authority to speak to that person, that aggregate person made up of many, uh, of many individuals. We'll talk more about that kind of prayer in a minute. The other thing that's so striking about this, this passage, a couple other things. One is this catalog of things that he did for her. He took such good care of her. When she was still a baby, he was the one who bathed her and washed off her blood and anointed her with oil. And then he talks about the clothes and the shoes and the, the silk and the, the, different, um, the different jewels, the gold and all the gifts. In other words, this is one of the passages where we understand that the Lord gives redemptive gifts to the nations. He chooses the gifts and he gives them, but his desire is that the nation would then use those gifts to bless other nations and not to use them selfishly. And in, uh, in the case of, of Israel here, this is one of the times when the, the gifts were being used very selfishly. But then he goes into this, this catalog of, this, of detailed sexual sin. Um, and this, it's so graphic that this passage is usually not preached on Sunday morning in most churches. And I asked the Lord as a new Christian reading this, this chapter, why the details? Why this catalog of sin? And I felt he showed me that when he looks at a nation... He sees the nation as she really is. In other words, he sees the princess that he created, to whom he gave these beautiful redemptive gifts, but he also sees the prostitute she has become. He sees the evil, the sin, the damage, the selfishness. This is not just to the nation, it's to her children and to the nations around about. And for him, he doesn't just see one or the other. Our tendency, on the other hand, is to see either the princess or the prostitute. And I think it's in ministry to a nation, whether, whether we're called to intercede for a nation for a time or to live there or just to visit and minister in and out, whatever ministry it is, we must see both. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But let me give a couple examples of seeing the princess of the prostitute. One of the most striking is, is France. Um, I'm surrounded on three sides by France. I look out my window and see France. And often people who come to visit here have been to France. And for many of them, it's their first time. And it's always so funny to hear their reactions because they've either seen the prostitute or they've seen the princess. <laughs> Most people, when they think of France, they, they think of the princess. France is the most visited nation on earth. More people pay money to go there than to any other nation on earth, even though it's not one of the biggest nations. Paris is the most visited city on earth. We have this totally romantic idea of Paris, that it's this wonderful, beautiful city, which it is, but I tell people, listen, it has the same weather as London. And they say, no, no, it can't have the same weather as London. It's sunny all the time in Paris. There's always blue sky. No, it's not. It's exactly the same weather. They're both next to the English Channel, and they both have lousy weather. <laughs> Paris just has better public relations. So there's this, this seduction, the seductive power to a nation or a city. And we see it with Paris which has love songs written to it. Just last year, there was a new love song written to Paris. The French, this French guy is sing, singing how much he loves Paris. In uh, America, our most seductive city to Europeans, well, there are two. One is New York City, 
for the energy um, and the power there. But the other one is San Francisco. And most Americans don't realize how seductive San Francisco is to Europeans. But we should because we have songs written to San Francisco, one of the most famous being, I left my heart in San Francisco, that one, and others. So when people write songs to a city, they have seen, they have seen the princess. They have fallen in love in a way. And um, there, in every culture, there are different songs like this. There's one written to the state of Georgia in America. Georgia, Georgia. So it's this uh, the expression of love to a nation, to a, a spiritual entity, which can be a city. Or you can see the prostitute. Several years ago, before Nelson Mandela, South Africa was the worst prostitute nation on earth when they had apartheid. I don't know if everyone listening remembers this time, but everyone just hated South Africa. They hated this, the nation. And we were sending teams down to South Africa from YWAM Europe to minister down there. And we had Christians in Europe getting furious with us. How can you send teams to that terrible nation? And we, our, we were surprised. We kind of said, well, they need the gospel just like everyone else. But we had people cut off support to YWAM because we were sending teams to South Africa. And then there was the peaceful revolution, Nelson Mandela, and South Africa became the most wonderful princess nation in the world. The place to be, the rainbow nation. How wonderful a place. And then after a couple of years, people realized it's not so wonderful a place. Cape Town and Johannesburg are two of the most violent cities in the world that aren't actually at war, like Baghdad. And there are some very real problems in South Africa, and they still have not completely succeeded in their peaceful revolution. We hope and pray that they do, because they have so much human potential there. The United States is now seen as a prostitute nation by many around the world, especially since the time of, of George W. Bush. We are seen as the source of all evil. Well, the truth about any nation is that there is a princess side and a prostitute side. And we must see them both if we're to be effective in ministry. If we only see the prostitute we will just focus on the problems and we won't be able to love that nation the way God loves the nation, the way God loves that particular nation. And we'll always be talking about the problems and how difficult it is to live there. And I've heard missionaries, as I've traveled here and there, you go to a nation and you listen to the missionaries and some of them, it's very clear they've seen the prostitute. And that's all they talk about. These people, you wouldn't believe how bad they drive. And their food, we won't even talk about their food, it's just horrible. And, and you can tell they, um, they really do not like the nation. And you can tell they're not very effective in ministry. Because that kind of attitude will come through, just, just e even in the tone of their voice. I was driving with a missionary around a, a city in Asia, and she was she was sure the driver didn't understand English. I was not so sure. But what was really clear is that she was looking and pointing at things and her tone of voice was full of disgust. And the driver didn't have to understand any English to understand her attitude toward that part of his city. So we must, we must be able to see both sides of the, of the nation. The other reason, even more important to see the prostitute, is that we have to be able to confess the sins of the nation. And that's what I think the Lord showed me. That's why he showed me he put this detail of sin in this chapter 16 of Ezekiel. Because he sees the sins as they are. Why? So that the sins can be confessed. 
I was struck a few years ago realizing that, um, you know, we talk about revival here and revival there and moves of the Spirit and big churches with thousands of people full of intercessors and, and, and of course here in Europe where that's not happening, with a couple exceptions, uh, but it's not usually happening. We're thinking, wow, why can't we see this in Europe? And we're, we have a kind of a, a holy envy of these other places. But some of these places that have these amazing moves of God, um, they're still full of problems of poverty, corruption, injustice, and nothing has changed on the national level. Now, on the church level, yeah, things are changing. There are new churches, there are bigger churches, there's lots of conversions. There's apparently a lot of, uh, a lot of missionaries going out. In that sphere of society, there are really good things happening. But it didn't seem to me that the church in that nation was making much of a difference. And I'm talking about three or four different nations. So I wonder, how can this be? How can this be? So I started listening more closely to the prayers that some of the people in those nations were praying for their nation. And it turned out that it, many of the prayers that I was hearing were very simplistic and ineffective. And they were kind of along the line of, Lord bless my nation. Which is a nice thought, but it's a, a prayer of a three-year-old. A mature Christian should not be praying that kind of prayer because the Lord is blessing every nation and every city and every group already to the extent that he can. Because we don't have to convince him to bless our nation. We don't have to convince him to love somebody. He already loves them far more than we do and he wants to bless them far more than we want to see them blessed. What's happening? What's happening is he cannot bless selfishness. He cannot bless sin. He cannot bless unrighteousness. So he's not about to bless a nation anymore unless there's repentance in the nation. And re specific repentance for specific sins. And this wasn't happening in these nations that I was hearing because the people of the nation had seen the princess. And they loved their nation and they saw the, the qualities of their nation and you talk to them and they just talk to you about the qualities of their wonderful nation and this is talking to people from, who's, from nations whose problems were making headlines that week around the world and they would not discuss the problems with you. They would only talk about how wonderful it is, how beautiful their nation was. They had seen the princess, but not the prostitute. When there's not repentance in a nation, and there usually is not, on enough of a large scale so that the Lord can bless because of repentance, he does that sometimes, such as at Nineveh with Jonah. He turned aside the judgment. But usually, there are not that many people repenting. But the Lord wants to bless anyway, so what he does is he raises up intercessors. And the intercessors conf confess the sin of the nation. And, and, and we don't know how forgiveness works exactly, but we do know that when a sin is confessed, a national sin, even by the people who haven't committed that sin, in other words, the intercessors, somehow forgiveness is released. There's a change in the heavenly places, in the heavenly atmosphere, and then the Lord is able to bless that nation in a new way. And one of the clearest examples we have is the, the high priestly prayer of Daniel in, uh, in the ninth chapter. So let's look at that one a little bit. Daniel is often called the prophet of the kingdom. There's so many kingdom principles, principles of government in this book. But in Daniel 9, we read that he's been reading the, the books of the prophets, and especially Jeremiah. And he read where Jeremiah prophesied that the exile of Israel was going to end after 70 years. And the time was almost up. So here's where Daniel, he doesn't do what we would be tempted to do because 
often when we hear a word of God, a, a prophecy or whatever, we just think, oh, well, God says he's going to do it. It's decided. I don't have to do anything now. Wrong. A word of the Lord, any kind of prophetic intuition, is an invitation for us to go into action. It's not so we can sit back. It's so we can rise up in the Spirit and work with God. This is what Daniel does. He doesn't just write a book on prophecy or do a, a video series. The, the prophecy is going to come to pass. That is often the reaction of too many of our own prophets in this day. But Daniel realized that there was no way that this word was going to happen because of the sins of his people. There was too much selfishness, too much unrighteousness, and God could not bless Israel by bringing their exile to an end unless something happens. So he starts to confess their sins. And I won't go into the detail of this. I'll leave, I'll leave it to you. But it, there are several points to his prayer. And he, 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 what he does is he identifies as the intercessor. He identifies with the sins of his people. We have sinned, verse 5, acted wickedly, committed iniquity, rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. We have not listened to the servants of your prophet. Down the line, but it's always we. It's not pointing the finger. Although Daniel was a righteous man, there's not one instance of any kind of sin or, or lacking in Daniel in the whole book, in his whole life, even though he served under three different kings with many, many temptations in those royal palaces. Anyway, he, he identifies with the sin and confesses the sin. And as we know from Ezra and Nehemiah, then the people are released in a measure from their captivity. Not all of them, but uh, big numbers of them were able to leave and to go back to Jerusalem. So here's, here's my point. If we want to be effective in prayer for a nation, if we want the Lord to bless our nation or the nation he's called us to more than he is, then we, we have to confess their sins. That's the job of the intercessor. That's the job number one. It's not, it's not asking God to bless anymore. No, he's already doing that to the max. It's opening a door so that he can act in, in greater and deeper and more powerful ways. So we have to be able to, to look at our nation and see how horrible the sin is in the sight of God. And friends, in my experience, we don't do that humanly. Because it's too hard for us, humanly, to face up to the sins of our nation. Um... It takes a degree of, of humility and ruthless honesty that most of us do not possess, except God helps us. And that's why if we want to be serious about making a difference in our nation, or the one he calls us to, we will ask him to see the prostitute, as well as the princess. But as I already said, um, we must be able to see the princess to understand that God's love for her includes his broken heart, as it was, as it's so clear in this chapter of Ezekiel 16. This prince whose heart is broken over his bride, we need to be able to feel that love for her, for our nation, in the same depth that God does, or as much as the same depth that he will give us to handle. He knows how much we can handle. And we grow in how much love, how much of his love for a nation or a city that we can handle. The, the princess, as we see her, we can see her, her beauty as the Lord reveals her. As we see her in the spirit, we see her beauty. Um, I think the artists of a nation 
when they paint the nation, sculpt the nation, they're, they're seeing something in the spirit. Uh, you see this in the portrayals of France as a nation, especially over the last two centuries since the revolution. You see what she looks like in the sight of God. This beautiful princess, but who has fallen into, into selfishness and been marked by sin. It's, it's necessary to see her in order to love her. Um, just imagine, on a purely human level, and this may have happened to some of you, that you've been engaged to someone, or almost engaged, and, and then all of a sudden you find out they're unfaithful. Can you imagine a worse disappointment, a worse pain than finding out the one that you, you had promised your life to and they had promised themselves to you <coughs> and, and you had given them beautiful and expensive wedding gifts and then you hear they're unfaithful. Not just once, with, but many times, not just with one lover, but with many lovers. And they have given your wedding gifts away to them. And they have borne children and sacrificed them to idols to be devoured. And that is the sin of every Western nation. It's the sin of abortion, which we don't talk about much in our circles. But for me, there's no difference between infant sacrifice and abortion. And this verse 20 says, gives us a very important principle. Children are born unto the Lord, not just to the parents, not just to the mother. An unborn child is not the property of the mother to decide all by herself what she wants to do with. An unborn child is born unto God, as well as to her, as well as to the father of the child. And I think that in many cases of abortion, it's the father of that child who bears a huge part of responsibility, at least as much as the mother, usually. Anyway. But I think as we see the princess, and we, we start to feel the heart of God, which is broken for his princess, longing for her to return, then what we can do is a very powerful type of prayer, which I have not experienced enough, and I would like to experience it more often, more regularly, is calling her back to God. Uh, we just did this in Brazil with a um, staff conference of a couple hundred people. Very committed staff, most of them long term. And we called her back. We called this princess back to the Lord. And as you know, in the preparation for the Olympics, all kinds of problems are coming up. There's crises in the government, corruption's being exposed. A lot of things aren't ready for the Olympics. Um, all kinds of immoral stuff going on with the police and with the oil money and all that kind. But we asked the Lord to show us the princess. We had a mighty time of prayer calling her back. She is a, she is a beautiful one. Let me mention a couple other principles from this chapter. Now, after 59 verses, The Lord, incredibly, renews his covenant with Israel. After all this catalog of sin, the Lord says, Nevertheless, verse 60, Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. So the Lord has, in this chapter, he's not just seen the prostitute, he gives us the, that clarity of sight and the judgment that she deserves. Um, but he, 
he remembers the princess. He sees her beauty and he extends forgiveness to her. And he said, I, says, I will remember my covenant. It's amazing, but this is, this is such a clear portrait of our Lord. How intensely he loves us with the intensity of a, a fiercely jealous fiancé. And that's a dimension of God's love that we, that we, we tend to keep away from, we tend to keep distant, because it's too scary. If he really loves us like that, then he sees our sin in the same clarity and detail that he sees the princess's sin in chapter 16. And his heart is deeply broken over us, not just her, so many centuries ago, but us here and now. But still, even if, as we see how much we've broken his heart, he says, I will re renew my covenant with you. What an amazing God we serve. There's another principle about the nations that comes uh, through here um, in, in verse 55. No, um, let, let's go back to the first time it's, it's mentioned in verse um, 46. He says, Your older sister is Samaria, who lives north of you with her daughters, and your younger sister, who lives south of you, is Sodom with her daughters. And then he does a, cons a, com a, cons a comparison, saying... Um, Israel's worse than they are. Anyway, my point in verse 46 is to remind us that the Lord sees nations as families of princesses. They're related more or less closely. And linguists have known this for a long time. So we talk about the Germanic language nations who speak some form of German, English is a form of German, Dutch is a form of German, Scandinavian languages are a more distant form of German. Then we have the Romance languages, which come from Latin, French, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, Romanian, those languages, that's another family. And then uh, you have the Slavic languages further east. Then out in Asia you have the Sinitic languages, the ones inspired by coming out of Chinese roots, which, which include Thai. So there are all these different families of nations which the linguists can trace through their languages. And now the same families are being confirmed by, by DNA research. So the, the Lord sees them um, as sisters. Sisters and nieces and cousins. And it's, it's really the family of nations is a biblical idea. And of course we know this because the nations, you see the table of nations already in Genesis 10 from the sons of Noah. They all came from one family, so they're all more or less related. Here's another point. The nations don't know their name their true name. And many of them are, have turned away from the Lord. And I, rate, I relate to this to the story of Cinderella. They have forgotten their true identities. So they've accepted another name, which is not their true name. It's an imposed identity put upon them by an outside power so that they'll forget who they really are in God and so that they won't be able to assume their true authority and therefore claim their right, rightful inheritance. The story of Cinderella for me is very, uh, very much linked to this story of the prince and princess of Ezekiel 16. Because we know that even Israel does not have her true name because in Isaiah 62, she's promised a new name. In the, in the book of the Revelation of John, we as individuals are promised a new name, 
if we meet the conditions, because we don't know our true names now either. The reasons we don't know our true names is because we don't know our true identities. You can't receive your true name until you know your true identity, which we'll only re receive, we'll only see when we come into that light, that perfect light. I was telling this, speaking about this principle in West Africa in one of our schools in Togo, and there was a guy there, a student named Ahmed, and he was a Tuareg. And you've certainly seen photos of them. They're the nomads in the central Sahara who wear a powder blue robe, and it completely covers them, head to, head to foot, except for a, a slit here to see out of. And he's sitting there in his Tuareg robe, and all I can see is his eyes. I have no idea how much he's understanding. He's a brand new convert, but he's a very, very smart guy, and he really gets this. And he came to the Lord through the radio ministry of a missionary out there in the Sahara. And so he went back after his school. He did a DTS with us and then a school of missions. And he, he realized, my people have a Cinderella name. As we know, Cinderella means ash girl, and her name means the same thing in every European language, whether Slavic, Romantic, or Germanic, or anything else. But that's not a real name. No loving mother would give her daughter the name ash girl. So this is what I was sharing. The nations are living under imposed names. And he knew something of the history of his people and they were called Tuaregs by the Arab traders. Tuareg up there means forgotten of God. And the Arabs called them that because they resisted Islam for so many centuries. They were Christians. They'd been evangelized by the Christians of North Africa. And they still wear a, a cross, a stylized cross called the Cross of Agadez. Beautiful. And it's Agadez is one of their towns in the middle of the Sahara. Anyway, they resisted Islam for so long that the, that the Arabs called them Tuareg, forgotten of God. But Ahmed said, no, we are not forgotten of God. And he went back to the radio ministry and, and got a program given to him by the missionary where he preached this. He said, God did not forget us. He sent his son for us. And God, God still loves us. And he proposed a new name. And I haven't heard that this was accepted uh, politically, but it was accepted by a lot of individuals who, who uh, became believers and have done some of our schools out there. And he said, Here sh this should be our new name, Kel Tamashek. It means the people who speak the language Tamashek, because that's what they call their language. But if we think about it a little bit, we realize many, many of the nations are under Cinderella names, or, or names that, that really do not carry their identity. Um, Deutschland means the people of the land. Um, but in many of the nations that were under the colonial powers, it was the colonial power who named them. Argentina was named for Argent, silver, because the Europeans went there for silver. The Gold Coast was Ghana's original name because they went there for gold. Also in West Africa, there was Upper Volta, which was a French colony. But after independence, they decided that was a dumb name and they wouldn't, didn't want to be named for a stretch of river, so they called themselves Burkina Faso, which mean, means the nation of upright men, which is closer. Venezuela was called that because some of the sailors who, who went there with Columbus were reminded of Venice when they saw the Indian houses on, on stilts in the water. They said, oh, that's just like in Venice. So they called it Venezuela. America, our country and continent, was named for a sailor with Columbus, a wealthy sailor named Amerigo. 
And actually, the name of our nation and continent is a fundraising strategy. That's our identity in the naming. And in Hebrew thinking, naming is very, very important for identity. But here's the point. The nations do not know their true names. And I believe that as we see the princess and the prostitute, and we call out to them, we call them back to their true prince, remind them of who they really are, remind them why they received those redemptive gifts, how they should be using them, uh, reminding them how their sin is hurting them and how they need to turn away from it, then they will start to turn back and there will be changes in the heavenly places, increased openness uh, across whole cities and populations. And we will see the nations returning to their prince, their maker. 